and I'd like to hand it over to Ginny Barber, who's going to talk to us today about trends in fair and open access. Thank okay. you. Great. Thank you very much. Thanks, Carly. It's, uh, thank you very much. It's great to talk to this group again. Um, it's uh, always a really nice group to talk to you up there. So thanks very much for the opportunity. Um, so I'm going to zoom through a whole pile of stuff. Um, you can have the slides, of course, and I'm really happy to follow up afterwards. Can I just check you're all hearing me okay? Yep. Okay, cool. All right. So I'm kind of assuming you know what the Australasian Open Access Strategy Group is, but just in case you don't, uh, this is us. Um, so we are we're supported by 10 universities in Australia, 8 in New Zealand, um, and we are essentially, my job is to work full time, well, work, work to advocate for open access across the Australasian region. I won't go through all the things that we do because it's kind of up there really, but I would just say if you're not on any of the groups that, uh, that we run, you're more than welcome to participate. We have communities of practice, we have a newsletter, we have a mailing list, we have Twitter, we have Facebook. There is absolutely no reason why you, you can't find some sort of way to uh, interact with us. We even got Instagram, although it's a bit quiet at the minute. Um, and we do this quite deliberately as a way of sort of getting the message out of a lot, along lots of different routes. And, but we also, as you can probably imagine, do quite a lot of stuff behind the scenes. So we advocate with ARC, NH and MRC, and are involved in a number of kind of uh, sort of national initiatives. And we also spend time trying to kind of find out what's going on internationally, keeping linked in there. Um, so I'm also assuming that this is quite a sophisticated group. Um, so I'm not going to go back to the basics of why we need open access, but I'm going to talk to you about some really interesting things that I think are happening nationally, internationally. And then I'm going to end with a, um, a really interesting paper that came out uh, last week, actually, which is a bit of a call to action, I think, about how we talk about open access and how we persuade people about uh, why it's important and, and what, what we kind of need to do as, as advocates. And I'm, I'm sort of hoping that everybody in this room is, a, is an advocate and wanting to be grabbed about what to do. So um, just to be really boring, I'm going to go through what open access is because, and again, I know you all know this, but I do it every time I talk because we often get confused with the idea of open access just being free access. And um, in fact, as you'll probably all know, the ARC in their, most, in their um, submissions for ERA, they are uh, accepting as open access anything that is essentially free to read. And that was, that's not an ideal position, but it was done, one done because right now there's a lot of confusion and people were misinterpreting what they meant. And it was important to be sure that they, uh, essentially what the a ARC was capturing this time in ERA was as complete a record as possible. But in the future, um, it's really clear, and you know, we've had a lot of conversations with the ARC and the NH and MRC. They will be moving to to a state where they expect open access to be equated with the right license that allows sharing and use and reuse. So that's a kind of aspirational aim, and that's where you know things really are kind of going uh, globally. But we're sort of we're sort of a lot on the way on the path. Really, we're not sort of uh, we're not there yet. And there's lots of issues with OA, and there's, you know, definitions is one of them. But also there are issues around people, how people sort of construe the, the movement, as it were. And so uh, last year, um, actually not last year, sorry, two years ago, um, I was part of a group that came up with a statement about fair access. And this was modelled on the, the model that you'll all be familiar with, with data, so findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. So that has very specific... Um, uh, meanings for how you apply it to data, but it can also be applied to other research or research outputs. And so in its simplest form, this, this is what it is. Um, and you can see immediately when you look at this, it's almost a way of operationalizing open access. So, you know, it explains why you need DOIs, explains why you need identical orchids, explains why you need to have things in your repository, you know, or in an yeah, open access journal. It, it kind of brings to the fore the importance of interoperability, so we're not just talking about flat PDFs that are free to read, and it, it reinforces the importance of a license. And so I think these are really concrete steps that you can, you can move along when you're talking about open access now. And, um, and I'm really heartened that over the past year this is, is coming more into the language uh, kind of nationally and, and internationally as well. So regionally, if you look at what's been going on, 
you all know that the ARC and NHMS have revised their OA policies. Um, I don't think either of them are perfect, um, and, um, and they would say that they are aspirational, but both mentioned FAIR specifically, and both the ARC and NHMRC have representatives on the FAIR steering group, which, um, which is currently being led by Jill Benn um, from the UWA. There's a lot of movement from central government. Um, the Productivity Commission has recommended a national and state OA policy, and that we believe is sitting somewhere within the Federal Department of Education. Um, slightly alarmingly, they've uh, supported the, the need for uh, an OA policy for each state and nationally as well. And we're hoping upon hope that they don't suggest that each state comes up with their own OA policy, because well, I think that would be pretty terrible. Um, so that's somewhere that we're, we're pursuing. There's all sorts of things, the national, um, you know, lots of uh, statements and um, uh, consultations that came out last year, and um, the National State Science Statement, for example, notes OA policy specifically, but somewhat to our disappointment, the 2030 Strategic Plan from Innovation in Science Australia didn't, so we're going to follow up with them. But there's also things like Creative Commons um, globally and in New Zealand, they're sort of changing themselves and create and are becoming uh, sort of more outward looking, I would say. Um, and what the people in New Zealand are doing is particularly interesting. They've turned themselves into a whole different organisation, which will be advocating for OA um, nationally in, in New Zealand. And then the other thing that's happening is um, there's a, a group called the Open Scholarship Policy Observatory, which came out of... Um, uh, it was the initiative of uh, some academics in Sydney, um, um, humanities scholars, and it's based on a Canadian um, network called the INCI network, I-N-K-E network, and they got together spontaneously to say, well, we need to be having uh, a way of collecting information about what's happening on open scholarship in Australia. And to my knowledge, this is the first time I've really seen this kind of coming up, sort of from quite a, a, a senior level within a group of academics and so we're involved with that in fact we've had a second meeting uh, a couple of weeks ago and there's going to be another one um actually at the humanities meeting that's happening in canberra next week but is anyone going to that meeting by any chance is meeting on data anyway so this this what i'm seeing is lots of things happening from lots of different directions i'm just keeping an eye on time okay so globally there's some really interesting stuff happening so um this person robert jan smits who was previously director general of Research and Innovation at the European Commission, somewhat to his surprise, apparently, was appointed as Special Envoy on Open Science last week. <laughs> he didn't know it, know it until he got handed the letter. Anyway, he's apparently delighted <laughs> and has said that he's going to spend, you know, that going to be using his position to really push the 2020 Open Access Agenda forward. And he's a very senior individual. And it's a kind of, I think, an interesting example of what happens when people at a very senior level in an organisation say that they're going to do something about it? They put somebody in charge who can actually talk to all the relevant groups. So that's pretty interesting. Other things to note is, um, and again, you'll be familiar with quite a lot of these things, the Budapest Open Access Initiative turned 15 last year and did a survey, a global survey. These aren't yet published, so um, they will be shortly, but, but not yet, you're getting a preview. But they asked, the, the, the survey asked, um, what do you think are the biggest barriers to OA kind of globally? And then what do you think are the biggest barriers at your institution? And incentives was number one for both of them. And I think that's really stark. And that, you know, I, I presented something pretty similar to this at the QUT um, uh, Research and Innovation Committee yesterday. And it, it was kind of met with interest because the institutions now need to understand that, you know, you can't just be expecting to have this to happen. But organically, you actually have to be do something about the incentive structure, and there was some discussion about that. And a lot of the pressure around incentives actually is coming from funders. So Gates has been really important in their, with their new journal. We know that the Wellcome Trust, which is probably the most you know, kind of aggressive about their OA policy, is actually going to in the process of revising it. So expect even um, tougher OA things coming from them. Um, Oh yeah, sorry, one other thing. The, the DORA initiative, which is uh, on uh, in, uh, metrics in science and you know, trying to move away from the impact factor. Um, a big thing is that all the UK funding councils a couple of, about a month ago agreed to sign up to it. I did look in Australia to see who had signed up and there's only five signatories and they're slightly strange ones. Well, one's not strange. Um, one is the Australian Academy of Science. The other one is, I think it's the Academy of... 
cotton growers or something like that. It's, I, I mean, I didn't even know it was a thing. Um, but there's the, the Academy of Science and the Australian uh, Medi Association of Medical Research Institutes has signed up, and one institute in Queensland has. Um, it's um, uh, it's not. I can't remember which one it is, but it's so it's a very piecemeal, and I think that we're quite a long way behind the rest of the world probably in signing up to that. So that's not, that's something I'm going to be pushing for. And then just a lot of stuff happening in practice. You know, there's uh, citations are kind of becoming more open. There's lots of stuff happening around metadata, metadata and the importance of that. And if you haven't had a look at Metadata 2020 site, so I'd encourage you. It's quite fun, and they're trying to do some interesting things about raising the awareness. And there's all sorts of things around. Um, you know, preprints, etc. Um, one thing that I, Stephanie asked me to mention is this UK National Scholarly Licence, which is a move within the UK to essentially allow universities to retain a copy of an article within their repository with a Creative Commons non-commercial uh, attribute, attribute CC BY non-commercial licence to do it um, across the board. Um, and the reason that they, they want to do this is because they realise that the gold model for them is not sustainable. Um, they're spending a lot of money on it. Um, and they also want to be able to have an opportunity to have their, really use their researchers' work within their institutions. And so there's a big move that's being led by Imperial College on that right now. Um, it's based on the Harvard model of open access. And um, what they did when they uh, developed it was put some consultations out and they looked at what was happening to, in Harvard. And Harvard found, using the Harvard model, they found that only about 5% of public, there were only about 5% of waivers requested. So 5% of times publishers were saying, this doesn't work with us, we want to opt out. Um, but what they've said now that it's going to happen on a national scale is the publishers are pushing back very hard and are threatening to. Um, basically ask for 100% waivers. So there's a bit of a turf war developing there, which is which is quite interesting. And then, really excitingly, OA Week this year is going to be on the theme of open access and equity, which I think is tremendous. And um, last year's one, which was open in order to dot, 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 was really kind of creatively uh, reinvented you know, kind of used by lots of people. People came up with things around global health, around, you know, access for developing countries, around um, also, you know, open access in order to improve scientific communication, etc., etc. But quite a few groups are now talking, almost going back to what the beginnings of open access was, which was in the end, it's about fair access to information. It's equal access for everybody. And um, spontaneously, in the, I'm in the international group that's looking at this, Quite a lot of people came up with the same theme, so it's really actually heartening. I think we're almost moving back to the, you know, the, the kind of the moral reasons why we had open access, which is not the only reason, but it is a really important reason. So I think that's going to be quite mm. exciting, um, and particularly with um, Alia having um, a focus on the Sustainable Development Goals, and um, as one of their things, they're very interested. In, I think there might be a really interesting tie in there. So watch this space. Um, we may also be doing an OA. Um, week something mid-year in June because we know that October is a hard time for people but if we do do something it will probably only be a day because of all the issues around trying to organize it so again watch this space and if you're interested want to help help coordinate this you know please get in touch we're really happy to have anyone who's interested um, and then as I've said fair is kind of coming all over the place I hope I hope a few of you came to our, um, our webinar earlier this week which is now up on the website um, we, took, we thought we'd use the opportunity to kind of pull some of these things out. Um, and there's a lot of work going on in this area. So uh, I would just say, if you hear the word fair in the context of publishing, make sure you know which one you're talking about. Um, but, but the fair journal principles in particular is quite an interesting one, because I would say that's almost like the, you know, the sort of the guerrilla wing of the OA movement. That there's, a, there's, a, um, there's actually a, um, a, a group that is working to, to sort of but be really quite left-wing in this. And I think it's great, actually. I think the more groups that are doing working in this space, they're not all going to be the same solution for, you know, they're not what, what, what works for physics is not going to work for humanities. And, um, and I think it's great that there's sort of energy from groups that want to push their, their version of this. Um, and again, the Fair Journal Principles is being led by a um, group of academics. So that's, that's pretty interesting, I think. Uh, I put this up really just to remind myself that sometimes you get conversations from people saying, well, you know, this is going to 
open access means that we can't commercialise, that it takes away our intellectual property, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I won't go through all this because I, I, you probably all know this, but it's just worth looking, pushing back this on this time and time again that this is not the case. That we we need to be slaying these myths about it being incompatible with um, commercialisation. So these are my takeaways from the past year is that I feel like we're, we're now at the stage of what do we do next to implement this. We're not talking about why we do it anymore. There is some really tough issues around infrastructure that's needed. You know, how do we make sure that everything has DOIs and it's applied consistently? How do we make sure other metadata is applied consistently? A APCs are a thorny issue and we do know that, you know, experiments in the UK show that it's really expensive if you just go down that route. So we have to be, we do have to be having some hard conversations there. But all of these are coming to the fore and particularly things like the OA2020 initiative, which is uh, um, based out of the Max Planck. One of the core things they want to do is to, is to surface the kind of cost of publishing. And that's really important. And there's some work that I'm involved in that's uh, doing that. And some of you may have been uh, responded to our survey on that, where we're trying to come up with an overall cost of publishing um, in Australia. Okay, keep going. All right, so what's an OA advocate to do with all of this? So this is a this is a really great paper that I would just really encourage you to have a look at if you haven't, haven't got it. It's 30, 30 pages, 30 odd pages. It's a lovely qualitative study. I'll pass it around here actually for a quick look at it. So it's online, so open access, obviously. And uh, I don't know if I don't know this li librarian. She's based in Saskatchewan, and she did a qualitative study of some res um, uh, what she called OA practitioners. So mostly librarians, but not exclusively in the UK. Um, and she's come up with some great, great messages. So I, I really like this. This is from her um, from her abstract about the need to be uh, about what you know uh, really distills the paper. And I'm going to go through some of the things she talks about, and then what I thought I'd do is turn it over to this group and just. Maybe we could have a quick conversation about what your experience is. So, so the first thing is delivering the message. And this one really struck me. It's like, don't use your green and gold and scholarly communications in weird terms. It's like, oh my God, we can't even talk about green and gold. You know, it's true, isn't it? We've all been in those conversations. I mean, I've been in conversations where people have, one terrible thing where somebody decided they were going to apply a green and gold to a completely different thing within scholarly communication. And honestly, I felt the blood drain out of me because I thought we can't possibly be discussing this again. You know, tailor the message. You know, I love this one. You know, if you're talking to people whose job is compliance, tell them they've got to be compliant. And then, surprise, surprise, they might do a better job at uh, getting things into their repository. It's That's really interesting. And I love the one at the bottom, do outreach by stealth, you know. <laughs> Don't say you're going to go and talk about open access. Go and talk about something else. <laughs> surprise, surprise, just saying <laughs> open access in. And in fact, um, just a little plug, a paper that, I'm, that Stephanie and I were involved in writing that came out um, on research integrity training that we're doing at QUT. The blog that we wrote with it, uh, on it um, with Mark Cooper, who's uh, in the Office of Research Ethics, is called Research Integrity by Stealth. Mm. You're kind of you're sneaking stuff in without them re realising it. So that's the first one, delivering the message. And then you say it again, <laughs> you know, start early. It takes a war of attrition. I mean, this is all really familiar stuff, isn't it? You know, um, I love this one. You need to tell somebody three times in three different ways every three months before they start actually remembering it. Or as um, uh, Campus Morning Mail, um, Stephen Matchett said about the previous um, chief scientist, he said, you have to be able to be ready to deliver something as an interpretive dance before people are willing to pay attention <laughs> to it. <laughs> Yeah, it's all true, isn't it? You think you walk in, it's a really simple concept. We'll just tell them what they've got to do, and you know, surprise, surprise, they don't get it. Talk to the right people, you know, you've got to go to the tops of if anyone who'll listen to you about it is interested, get them in it. Comes from an academic, that's really important. No single sector. I like this at the bottom, but what last one is not about who, who you're talking to, but said so we need a customer relations management system for this. We need to be systematically tracking who we talk to about it. Does anyone do that systematically? If so, can I have their system? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I have a you know, massive spreadsheet of people I talk to, but I probably don't do it as systematically as I should do. I thought that was really interesting. Mm -hmm. Know your stuff. This was a great one. It's like, do not send people in who, who are going to get tripped up. I love this particular one. Researchers will challenge you or test your expertise before they accept you as an expert topic. 
So really, really be careful who you send to talk to top people about this because you get one chance and if you're not perceived as being a serious person, you know, you may never get another chance. I, I thought that was really, really important. And researchers like to discuss the details, oh, they do, you know, so be ready to do that. Um, be political and persevere. Um, we all know there's politics in your institution. I have the delightful job of working, I guess, for 18 institutions, you know, that are my employers. They've all got very dramatically different uh, politics. Some of them you can't even you can't even have the conversation and don't you know don't push it when you know you can't. Um, and then library politics and you know there's, there's national politics and there's international politics. So I think this is really quite interesting. And I thought I, I also recognise this thing about OA practitioner burnout, which is a re very well recognised thing within other sectors. Ooh, sorry about that. So we know what I'm doing. Sorry, we're getting a strange. Uh, they can't see that. You can't see. I'm going to carry on, but you know it is tough. So if, you, if you're getting fed up with whatever, even if, even if it's not around open access, you know, give yourself a chance to talk with others who do this. Don't don't feel like you're the only person that has to carry the torch with whatever it is. And you could apply this across a whole different range of things. It's obviously not just for open access. Um, and then you know, be aware that sometimes people will only do this because it's due to do with compliance. So again, you know, that's why I think the era OA reporting is really important. Um, it's probably the only thing that may get your research office paying attention to it. Um, but if that is the thing that gets them paying attention, great. And you say to them, in three years' time, we're going to do better. So let's talk, start talking now about how we do better. But we don't want to make people think that you know, it's a box-ticking exercise. That is a that is a big issue. So obviously, you know, um, you, you're welcome. Read the paper and, um, and read the slides afterwards. I've just picked out some little highlights. Um, I will also just, I'm one thing that I've been doing a lot of thinking about how we talk to people about uh, OA, and I'm, I think it's a really interesting area. There's a whole, you know, there are many, many areas where people have, uh, you know, have lots of experience in advocacy, and I think to some extent we probably haven't done as good a job as we could have done on building on things. I've actually just finished reading a fantastic book that if, I don't know if anyone's read it, and, uh, that talks about how the, uh, the British slave trade was abolished. It's called Bury Your Chains. Bury the Chains. If you haven't read it, I really urge you to. And it has a lot of, it, it almost is the first national systematic campaign to change something. And it started with a small group of people who realised there was an issue, who talked across the generations. <coughs> so, you know, senior people talked to junior people, recruited other people. They kept at it. They used smart uh, messaging. Um, and in the end, they, they worked with people that they thought could help them, and they didn't give up. Um, and you know, obviously, this is a very different thing, but I think that we can learn a lot from people that have been successful in other areas. So, um, we've got a few minutes, and I'd really just love to hear what people's thoughts are about how you approach this and things that have worked, and um, perhaps we could even, you know, follow up after this with a, a sort of compilation of what's really worked. I wonder if we could actually start a wiki page or something and get people to put things in, just to sort of crowdsource what, what everybody's done well. So, uh, Thanks very much and happy to happy to discuss.